My name is Ted Papa George. I'm the president of the Culinary Workers Union Local 226. Um, I am very happy to be here. We have an hour coming up, I think, with a tremendous panel and a couple of authors that have put together a book that I think for anybody involved in this industry is a must read. I'll give it a plug myself because it is just a tremendous, a stunning piece of work and a tremendous amount of background and quite exciting to read too. And, um, uh, and we're gonna hear a lot about that coming up. So um, Max and Sujit, why don't you take it away? Great. Uh, thanks, Ted. Thanks, Ted. And thanks to the uh, Culinary Union for having us. This is a great panel, and we're uh, excited uh, to have this discussion. We've been doing a lot of these um, discussions uh, since the book came out a few months ago, but uh, most of those, as you can imagine, have been focused in the in the worlds we live in, which is uh, financial journalism, kind of private equity, Wall Street. And so uh, to have this discussion, which is a, a little bit different, uh, is a lot of fun, and uh, it's just great to be here. So we're looking forward uh, to this hour. So. Uh, I am Sujit Ndapa, I'm a journalist at the Financial Times. Uh, and Max again, Max and I again are, are financial journalists and he'll tell you more about how this project came together. Uh, but uh, I think the reason we, we wanted to write this book, one of the main reasons was that uh, we wanted to bring this world of private equity and distressed debt and chapter 11 bankruptcy uh, to, uh, to a mainstream audience. This is obviously a book about uh, the LBO of Harris in 2000. And, uh, it was announced in 2006, it closed in 2008. It's an almost $30 billion transaction, uh, the biggest uh, type deal of that size uh, in Las Vegas history. Uh, and so the, back, the backdrop to this, to this Wall Street-centered story is uh, Harrah's uh, and the gambling and casino industries, each which have rich histories, and they play a big part in how the, the main story unfolds. And so uh, I think we're fortunate as, as storytellers and authors to have this really interesting company and industry uh, to, to enable and enhance the story. I kind of wonder if we were just doing a book, same kind of topic, but around like airline parts, uh, would it be as much fun? And it probably would not be. Uh, and so as you may know, uh, in the audience, Harris does have this uh, rich backstory. It starts at this bingo hall in, in Reno in the 1930s, and then we pick up the story uh, when Bill Satry, uh, who was the CEO of Harris in the 90s, Harry, uh, hires uh, this Harvard Business School professor named Gary Loveman uh, to implement this, uh, this marketing scheme, uh, which would be known as Total Awards, and it turns Harris into this powerhouse in the 1990s and 2000s. And so one of the aspects we get into in this book is just uh, how the character of Las Vegas changes over time. And we'll talk about this today, how kind of Wall Street and big business becomes, uh, becomes a big part of uh, Las Vegas and gaming, which was traditionally kind of a family run or otherwise run uh, type of business. Uh, and we certainly get into like the regulatory evolution uh, of Las Vegas uh, and gaming. Uh, and so the other thing I'd, I'd want to mention, just as a kind of setting up uh, the discussion today, is that uh, there is this increasing debate uh, about how private equity uh, and Wall Street pervades uh, every industry out there now, and the social costs of, of heavy debt and the need to earn returns, and what does all that mean for, for workers? Obviously, you've seen high-profile disasters that retail companies like Toys R Us, and uh, we'll get into this later, but at Harris, once there's financial distress and the bankruptcy, um, uh, there's obviously layoffs, there's the 401k getting suspended, there's a pension uh, a pension situation, uh, the pension gets terminated uh, as a part of the bankruptcy uh, for some workers. And so uh, all of those things like play into, play into the story uh, and we wanna get into those today. Uh, and so let me turn it over to Max, who I think is gonna just walk us through the, uh, the outline of the story and then we'll introduce our panel and get started with the discussion. Uh, thanks, Sajid. And again, yeah, thanks to the Colonial Union for having us today and, and hosting this discussion. Um, I, I, I wanted to walk through the timeline of, uh, you know, of our book uh, and Caesars in, you know, in a little bit of a different fashion right now for, uh, uh, you know, to, to, <clears throat> to kind of launch this discussion. Uh, and so I, I looked up uh, uh, kind of the employment and collective bargaining agreement stats uh, for Caesars over, over time. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I think that this is like, this is always one of the most interesting and left out portions of financial journalism. I'm the head of uh, special situations coverage for Fitch Solutions. Uh, and that's just, it's a niche technical publication that goes out to uh, Wall Street, distressed debt investors, institutional investors, investment banks, and law firms. 
Uh, what's missing a lot of the times is the most vulnerable stakeholders, uh, which would be you know the employees and the people that are affected by the businesses that these people are are running and investing in and financing. Uh, so at the end of 2007, as Sajit mentioned, the buyout started in 2006, but it wasn't finished until 2008. Uh, and so the last uh, the last full year before the completion of the buyout. Uh, Caesars, uh, which then was known as Harris, uh, Caesars had 87,000 employees across 50 casinos, six countries, um, and of those, 28,000 employees were covered by collective bargaining agreements. Uh, by the end of 2008, financial crisis is in full swing. The buyout has just closed earlier that year. Uh, they, they made some moves already. Uh, 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 but uh, the employment level at Caesars is down to 80,000 people across now 53 casinos, 26,000 covered by collective bargaining agreements. So 2008, 2010, they're doing a bunch of distressed debt exchanges. Uh, the company is uh, clearly over levered. It has too much debt. It can't keep up with the interest payments, has to start getting creative. Uh, Atlantic City uh, revenue and, and, uh, and cash flow are, are declining rapidly. Uh, by the end of 2010, uh, Caesars employed 69,000 uh, people across 52 casinos. Still, 26,000 people are covered by collective bargaining agreements. Now, you bring us to the uh, bringing us to the the end of essentially Apollo and TPG's ownership of the company before it filed for bankruptcy at the end of 2014. By the time 2014 rolls around. Uh, the debt has traded into you know, deep discounts. There have been a lot of negotiation with creditors. They can't come to an agreement with all of them, but they've come to an agreement with one group and they're about to head into bankruptcy. And at that time, Caesars employs, uh, at the end of 2014, Caesars employs 68,000 people across 49 states and 28,000 were covered by collective bargaining agreements. So Caesars then goes through bankruptcy. It files for Chapter Eleven uh, in in Chicago, and where it's you know it's ultimately um, uh, you know, orchestrated. Uh, in uh, early 2015, it takes two years uh, in uh, Chapter Eleven. At you know at, at the when the company is in Chapter Eleven, um, there's an automatic stay, so it doesn't have to pay interest payments among other things, so that it can restructure the business and emerge. And that's the point of Chapter Eleven. Uh, as opposed to chapter seven, when there's just a liquidation. This is a real business. People's lives depend on it. They want to restructure it, come to an agreement with creditors, lower the amount of debt and exit healthy. Uh, and it was, you know, our book covers that period uh, very closely between 2015 and 2017, where it is a, a you know, a, a drag out bare knuckle affair between the creditors and the private equity owners and their, you know, their clever lawyers and advisors. Uh, you know, all the while, you know, the, the employees and the people running the company are trying to make sure that it, it improves, uh, which they are able to do because interest payments uh, have stopped. The uh, great financial crisis impact has, has lessened. People are coming back to Las Vegas. And so the, you know, the, the company and the operations really do improve over that time. Uh, and by the time the company emerges, the, full, uh, the first full year uh, uh, or the first year after it emerges at the end of 2017, uh, Caesars employs 65,000 people and 28,000, this is remarkable, 28,000 people still covered by collective bargaining agreements. Um, uh, so I, that brings us to today at the end of 2020, it's a very difficult year. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, and, and Caesars went through a, a, another acquisition. It looks completely different. Um, uh, so, the, you know, it's not really an apples apples comparison, but over the course of time, I thought that was just an interesting look to see how 10, you know, tens of thousands of jobs were lost over the course of time. Uh, uh, but a relatively consistent number of people who were, were you know, uh, had co collective gar bargaining agreements uh, uh, kept their employment. And, and, I, and I, I did think it was, you know, it was very interesting uh, and important how, uh, you know, they, they fit into um, uh, the, you know, the negotiations and then the, uh, you know, the, the emerged company. Um, uh, uh, so that like that, that, that's where I think I want to start to hand it off to our wonderful panel here who are, are, are really the highlight, uh, uh, who can get into, uh, uh, you know, more about, uh, you know, how this applies to all the people, uh, you know, on this call and, and that are running these, uh, these casinos and, and who it really impacts at the end of the day. Uh Great, Max. That's uh, a good place to, to jump off from. So uh, we actually have another author on this uh, 
on this panel, and that is uh, David Schwartz, who is a professor at UNLV, and he's an eminent historian of Las Vegas. And I have his book here, uh, Grandissimo, The First Emperor of Las Vegas, How Jay Sarno Won a Casino Empire, Lost It, and Inspired Modern Las Vegas. So maybe the place to start uh, would be, David, uh, if you just briefly introduce yourself and tell us just about, very briefly, the history of Caesar's Palace, how it came from, and what it, how it kind of ushered in the modern Las Vegas, which ultimately I mean, culminates in, uh, in, the, in the Harris transaction. Sure, uh, thanks, Sajid. Uh, so yeah, my name's Dave. I've written a couple books. One of them was about Jay Sarno, the guy who built Caesar's Palace, which really was the last of the old school Vegas casinos to be built. You know, when they built it, it cost 19 million. Half of the money came from a Teamsters loan. Half they scraped together from various sources. And really they almost didn't open because they didn't have enough capital which was a very legitimate concern. It was kind of touch and go at first, but it was incredibly successful because Jay had the idea that if you surround people with stuff that they like and just give them this great immersive atmosphere, they would eat it up and they did. And this really paved the way, set the profile for what Vegas would become. And you know, I'd like to say the whole what happens here thing with Vegas really started with Caesar's Palace back in 1966. You know, Jay didn't own the casino for very long and then got bought by the Perlman brothers who uh, took the, their version of the company was called Caesars World. Eventually that was acquired by ITT. Eventually it ends up with Park Place Entertainment which renames itself Caesars Entertainment then gets acquired by Harrah's which is where your book comes in. So it's, and it's really, until the Mirage opened in 1989, Caesars Palace was the number one Vegas casino for the high-end stuff. And I think even today, it's probably the most recognized casino name and casino brand in the world. So it really is a powerful uh, symbol of Las Vegas. And uh, just to your point, I mean, this company was known as Harrah's. It is Harrah's, it, but it changed the name to Caesars just because Caesars resonates in a way that no other uh, no other name resonates in, in this world, even if there are nicer casinos now in, in Las Vegas and elsewhere. And so uh, Rich, Richard uh, Schoenz, maybe you could uh, introduce yourself, but you actually knew Bill Harris. So tell us uh, about yourself and uh, how you, uh, how you uh, knew Bill Harris many years ago, who was the, obviously the, the name uh, behind this company. You gotta unmute yourself though. One of my favorite expressions in this generation of the pandemic has been, you just have to be smarter than the mute button. Uh, uh -huh. I, um, I didn't know Bill Hare. I saw him at where I worked. I went to, as a college student and working on my undergraduate and masters, I dealt cards for him and I went to work at night at nine at night and dealt cards till three in the morning. I was honored to have the opportunity to work for him because I thought he was a, a material presence in the industry. I thought he cleaned the industry up to a certain extent, which made it available to export. Um, he, he was a very different style than much of what was taking place in Southern Nevada. Uh, but anyway, I, I worked there. I then left the University of Nevada and went to the University of Utah to work on my PhD in economics. And I ended up spending about two and a half years writing on the evolution of the Nevada gaming model, which really took place from about 45. Uh, well, actually, I, I think the material stuff started late in the 40s and in the 50s and really under the tenure of, of the governorship of Grant Sawyer. That's when a lot of stuff happened that shaped the, the model, which has been my interest in your book, the regulatory piece. I then became a ski bum for a while <laughs> dealing dice again. Uh, but then I ended up going to work for Mr. Wynn. I left Mr. Wynn to go to the uh, uh, Howard Hughes people. I, uh, I and then ended up joining Mr. Adelson. I then ended up joining the Boyds and, and being experienced at the, uh, the Stardust, which was um, one of the conversations I had with my partner that took that over was we thought there were 25 independent businesses in that building. And after a year, we thought we had it down to 17. Um, I then left and got into tribal gaming. Um, I then took some time off and then I went into the regulatory space and I've also done quite a bit of teaching. I, I've taught across the United States. I've taught in China. I've taught in Switzerland and whatnot. So that, that's my background. I seem to write a lot about re regulation and that's been my interest in this. this and so on that note, uh, maybe you can just tell our audience um, and we get into this uh, in the book. And so this buyout is announced in 2006. 
uh, at the peak of the market. Uh, it takes 14 months to close. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, it takes such a long time. The world changes in that 14 months is that uh, Caesars and Apollo and uh, TPG have to go state from state to state trying to get a uh, uh, license in each of these jurisdictions. And that process is very onerous and intrusive. And that is one reason private equity has stayed away from uh, the gaming industry. They didn't want that kind of scrutiny. So uh, maybe just for our audience, you can just explain uh, at a high level what the, what the licensing process is about and what regulators are trying to do. And um, again, in the book, uh, there's some very uh, kind of colorful scenes uh, about these very rich masters of the universe from New York and other big cities going to these state capitals trying to get uh, trying to get these licenses. Gary Ludman, uh, if you read the book, you'll see he's not very impressed with the uh, the quality of uh, the regulator, and uh, it's a area of frustration for him. So maybe just tell us about what uh, what this regulatory process is about and what it's like to go through it. The process has its roots to Nevada during during the very late 40s and 50s. There was an issue. Nevada was only state that offered casino gaming and it was one of the issues was that it was argued that they were associated with organized crime the chicago sun times made a career out of publishing articles and a lot of politicians one remembers nevada was a very small state a lot of politicians when you only have one congressman and two senators it's not a massive block uh, and, and a lot of politicians have found that they could stand up and talk about this terrible place, Nevada, and, and establish their bona fides as a law and order type of candidate. Yeah, I mean, you still see politicians doing that kind of thing today. Anyway, it became a concern that the, that the federal government may wipe out Nevada. And so they developed a regulatory system. And the regulatory system was to legitimize the industry and, and, and basically to build a moat around it. So and, and the cornerstone of that regulatory enti entity was the, the background investigation, you know, what is known as the suitability check. And, and I've gone through basically 120 of these because I was on the board of directors and one thing, and, th and they're unpleasant. Um, they used to be done by policemen who would show up with guns and stuff, and they would interview you more as if you just robbed a 7-Eleven than if you were just a, a, as an executive trying to apply. But what they really, there's two reasons for the background check. And, and this is important to understand because it's very important to understand because of the product you guys developed, which I think is quite brilliant. One, the backgrounding is important for the branding of the industry. That is to say, as if someone comes up and finds out that the participants in the industry are the sources of finance are in some ways inappropriate. If it's mob controls or the person has a a terrible record of past behaviors, that damages the brand of the industry. And as such, what we would use in the language of today, it affects its sustainability. The other thing is, is we found that the background check or the regulators at this time found out that the background check was a great predictor of behavior. That is to suggest that if the person had in their past behavior been honest and operated with a high level of integrity, they could be anticipated to do the same going forward. And this is really important because like when I dealt blackjack for Mr. Hera, um, the cameras weren't there. They were just introducing cameras. You know, when I used to, even when I was at the Stardust in the eighties, I would call the cameras weren't good. It's on a blackjack table. If you have a $50,000 bet and you lose it, you don't get a receipt. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to document a lot of these transfers. I would call the casino on my way to work back in the days when the, the car phones were attached by the cord. And I would say, how'd we do? And they go, oh, we lost some money last night. A guy beat us out of about 30,000. I'd say, who is it? And it was, it was Bob, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what do you mean Bob? <laughs> you know, and so I'd get there and there wasn't a lot of ways to do that. So we wanted to make sure, and the regulators wanted to make sure that the people had behavioral characteristics in their past. And, and, and so that's what it's, what it's ab about. And, and what they look to do is, are these people with character, honesty, and integrity? And, and, and that's where I found your book fascinating, because in what you've done is you provided some documentation that's going to allow people, and, and I'm looking at this more in the future, because there's a $6.5 billion transaction taking place in Las Vegas, and these people are going to need to be licensed. And um, when you look at this book, one of the questions, and, and, and you've done a brilliant job here, is it's not complicated. 
you're going to ask the same question the regulators are going to ask, and that's going to be, are these people of character, honesty, and integrity? And, and there are a lot of portions of your book, I would call it exhibit number one, they're going to challenge that position. I think the second document, and you've really exposed this document to the world to a large extent, has been the bankruptcy examiner's report by Richard J. Davis. I think that's probably been one of the most brilliantly written documents I've seen in, the, in a great deal of time. Well, there's some things that are going to have to be answered there that, again, address character, honesty, and integrity. I think the Vanity Fair article that was about you two gentlemen being threatened by the law firm, I, Paul Weiss, and I think threatens probably appropriate language there. And I think the Vanity Fair article does that. And you can say, well, that's just Apollo's and TPG's or Apollo's law firm. Those, that law firm has been very well connected to Apollo for a long time. Millions and millions of dollars have flown through there. And, and I think that's kind of an important stuff. And, and so I, I, I suspect what you've done is you've turned back the curtain to a large extent about who we are licensing, you know, and, and I think that's terribly important. Um, so Richard, uh, you're, so Richard's referring to uh, Apollo, which is one of the two uh, principal owners of Harris uh, buyers in, in the buyout. Uh, they eventually, years later, and you read the book, you'll find this out. They sell out of Harris and Caesars, uh, but they are now returning to Las Vegas. They're buying the Venetian uh, from, uh, from, uh, Las Vegas Sands. And, uh, that transaction was just announced a few months ago. And that was, I guess, going through the, the regulatory process now, or, or soon will be. So, uh, Apollo is returning to, uh, to Las Vegas now after, uh, after, uh, the Harris, uh, situation. Uh, well, normally the, the regulators have to go and do a big investigation. I would argue they just need to read your book. They need to look at Richard. Oh well, yeah, no, they're, uh, they want to buy. If they want to buy the book, I'm, 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 that's great. Uh, and, and, and we'll send them a couple of copies. Yeah, read the back. Buy the copies. For, so I, I did. So Richard, I was, I was curious as to um, if there is a re repeat buyer, right? Uh, is is the licensing process less onerous the second time around? Uh, or you know, how long does it last uh, if they've you know, if there's uh, uh, someone who's going to go through the process again? Yeah, you know, it's an, an, an issue of states' rights. Um, and and, and as, as as Sujit mentioned, you have all these different entities. Um, Nevada's always had a reputation as the gold standard, and, and I think the men and women of the Gaming Control Board are some of the most highly respected people in, in my life. They're just very good. I've been very disappointed in the Nevada Gaming Control Board of late because it's just gone through so many transitions in leadership, and that's very unhealthy, I think. Um, it, it's been subjected to some shocks there, uh, and that's for political reasons, nothing else. Um, but... Um, Max, under normal circumstances, I would say, yeah, you've been through the loop. You, you, you know, I used to sit on the commission in California and when IGT would come before us, you know, I would see in this big binders they would put together on in these investigative reports that we were the 137th jurisdiction to look at them. And, and I kind of always thought, well, you know, we probably won't find it. If the 136 before us missed it, we won't. Under normal circumstances, I would say, the second time through is going to be a lot easier. There's some things that have happened here that are not good in that regard. I would suggest for Apollo, one's your book, two, the examiner's report, which is is now seeing the light of day, the Vanity Fair stuff. You know, there's the incidents of Leon Black. You know, that that's with his two issues. One, there's a woman that he has admitted to, I believe, paying money, and she's suggesting it was as a result of... Uh, some type of sexual abuse. And then there's also this curious situation of him paying a substantial amount of money to Jeffrey Epstein. Now, that was just kind of weird. Now, everyone, there, I think the law firm has suggested, well, that was just, yeah, you got good advice and it saved him billions. That, that's an interesting story. Um, but Nevada doesn't like that. You, you, you know, they don't like that one of their big people, now people can say black's gone. But, but Samber is a, a little bit of an issue. And here's why I think he's a little bit of an issue. I think if you were to sit down with Richard um, Davis and say, do you have any challenges 
with Mr. Samber in terms of his credibility. I think that might be a little bit of a prolonged discussion. You, you know, so I think under normal circumstances, I'd say the next trip through is easier. What has happened is you put a lot of stuff on the table that I don't think anybody knew about, you, you know, that only was people came to understand through closed session and whatnot, where they're going to have to really work hard to make sure that they don't look like they've just been over here because if it's a $6.5 billion transaction. So the Gaming Control Board clearly wants to say, yes on this clearly but they want to be very careful doing this now part of the problem with, with these things going back to your original question is how do these states do it the chairman of the nevada gaming control board sandra morgan is not now but the last one i got a record for us, it makes 132,000 a year that's the highest paid person in that organization there's an asymmetry here in this warfare that's unbelievable I was hired by the state of Kansas in 2010 to look at Harris um, financials because they were curious about some things. And I spent four years undergraduate, two years master's, five and a half years in PhD program. And I wrote Kansas, my boss in Kansas almost every day and said, I've fallen into Harris financials and I can't get up. <laughs> you know, those are complicated. So to expect a regulatory agency to be able to get through that and to successfully compete with some of the giants in the world were amazing. You, you, you know, I mean, even Loveman in your book, you mentioned that he says, well, those are really smart finance guys. I left it to them. Like he was the marketing guy and, and, it, and you know, he left the finances to them. And, and I love that you mentioned that, interestingly enough, that he went back to Harvard and taught finance, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, which is hilarious by the way. Yeah. But, um, but, so on um, that note on Loveman, I'm actually going to jump in here for a second. Uh, Leanne uh, Vachon, uh, you are a longtime uh, employee of uh, Harris and Caesars uh, at Paris, uh, uh, as I understand it. Uh, maybe you could tell us um, what, was, uh, what was it like working in Loveman's organization before the buyout. I mean, Her we spend a lot of time on the rise of Loveman and, and Harris and total rewards and how it turns into this juggernaut and this uh, M&A machine, which ultimately attracts the interest of these two private equity firms. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, there's the, the whole conceit of uh, Loveman's like uh, uh, brilliance. Uh, there's a few things, but one of them is this idea uh, of the service profit chain. It's a very famous uh, paper he wrote at Harvard Business School about how you can use customer service as a uh, differentiator for your product. Uh, and this is important for, for Harris, which was competing against Wynn and uh, MGM and Kirk Corian. And, uh, those those uh, rivals were much, much flashier. And so there was a sense that uh, Harris had better uh, customer service. It was more in tune with its customer. Uh, so maybe you can just tell us the, uh, the employee perspective of, of working uh, uh, at Harrah's before the, uh, before the private equity guys showed up. I, I, I'll, I'll say this. After, uh, after reading your book, I have a whole new outlook about how my relationship with that company is. It's, it's totally amazing to me the disregard for the workers that that company had, that equity firm had when they came in and how things changed a tremendously, tremendous change as far as the work ethic and how people were treated by that equity firm. It was, and I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, Loveman's service profit change philosophy that he had when he, when he came in. When the equity firm came in, they did the Kaizen and they did all these things but what that, the whole point of that was, was to displace workers. That's all it was. They started to, to get rid of all the incentives that the company had. They started to boil the workforce down to its lowest denominator. And the morale after that cut equity firm took over was just, just flat, just totally flat. And it was because of the way that they were running the company it was like they were running the company as if they didn't really care about service. They didn't care about the workers and that they didn't really care about anything except having as much, uh, having as much profit as from what we saw that they can get. And, it so was just, uh, and you bring up an interesting point. So for those of you who are listening, what happens in this buyout is they, 
they buy the company for roughly $30 billion, 24 of that uh, is going to be debt. And so they're paying more than $2 billion of interest expense every year, uh, which is an enormous amount of money, even in normal circumstances. But after 2008, 2009, profits come down quite sharply. And so there's just not enough money uh, to make those interest payments. Uh, and then uh, one of the interesting things we do get into the book is just uh, how much, uh, how much, uh, capital expenditures are cut and just like the, the state of the properties. And um, casinos generate a lot of cash flow, but they also require a lot of upkeep uh, and uh, investment uh, to stay current and compete with other properties. So maybe you can just tell us about your recollections of like what happened uh, after the buyout as, as far as it, as, as, as it relates to capital expenditures right. and upkeep of, upkeep of the properties and just what, what it felt like on the ground. Right. Well, well, the thing, the thing about the property, the property started to go down because what they did is they would start having uh, crews where there was one station that one person would have one station. Now that person had a station and a half and where one person had one area. Now they had an area and a half. So they, you couldn't keep up. There was no way to keep up with the staffing that they, that they, that they had. So luckily for us, we had the culinary union and we had a union on our side but the people who did not have a union were really in trouble with this kind of thing. I, I'll give you, I'll give you an instance. This is, and this is really what it boils down to the, even the food quality in the hotel for the workers was so bad that we had to file grievances about the food. And I was one of the people who went into the arbitration about the food and the people who were on the hotel side defending in that literally we had talk conversations with them before, they were hoping we would win because that's how far it went down. The quality of the food in the place was horrible that we had a literal food fight in, in arbitration. That's the quality of, of the, how they were treating the workers at this point. So Nancy, I'm going to jump to you. Uh, you're obviously a bankruptcy expert. You're a bankruptcy lawyer and now you're a professor and you're actually involved in this case. You're what's known as the fee examiner and uh, the fees were enormous. And maybe we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and there was plenty of money for the lawyers, maybe not for the food at Caesar's Palace, uh, in these casinos, but there's there always money for the lawyers. Um, but tell us, uh, tell our uh, viewers just how uh, in bankruptcy, just how like other stakeholders, like the workers, suppliers, uh, pensioners, uh, like where they, where they fit into the actual chapter 11 process and uh, what happens to them in, in these situations. Sure. Um, where you do have these uh, incredible fights between private equity firms and It It's fair to say that people can have a voice, but it is a faint and distant voice is the best way I can explain it. In bankruptcy, what happens in a chapter 11 is the people who ran the company before the bankruptcy run it during the bankruptcy. It's the exact same managers who put it into bankruptcy who keep running it under most circumstances in an 11. And the 11 is designed to say, all right, this is what we have as of the date of filing. These are what we owe. This is, these are the assets we have. And it ultimately is supposed to culminate in a plan of reorganization that takes the company forward outside of bankruptcy. For people like employees, there are some statutory protections, but they're limited. So you have the debtor in possession running it. The Department of Justice through the United States trustee program appoints a committee of unsecured creditors. Employees are unsecured creditors. They don't have collateral they can go against. They, they have to wait till the end of the line, but there is a committee of the seven largest creditors who are supposed to represent their voice. Now, when I say end of the line, it gets a little bit more complicated, but I promise not to professor it up to you. The idea is that for certain amount of wages pre-petition, they're a little higher on the priority scale, but Sujit, as you point out, they're still below the lawyers. They're a little bit higher on the priority scale in terms of some pre-petition wages. Their post-petition wages get paid as usual, but the only way they have a real voice is if the unsecured creditors committee takes up that voice and points out the employee's needs or 
if the court decides to appoint an additional committee made up of entirely of employee interest. The court did not do that here. So the only way for an employee to have a voice in addition to voting on a plan of reorganization is to make concerns known to the unsecured creditors committee. And the unsecured creditors committee in Caesars was active. It was a cage fight between the lawyers for the debtor in possession and the lawyers for the creditors committee. And I, you know, I have this image of putting the two lead lawyers in a room and duking it out. And they, it's fair to say they don't spend time socially with each other. They did not walk away from that happy with each other in part because of the allegations that the unsecured creditors committee made that the lawyers for the debtor should not have been the lawyers for the debtor. But that's a whole different fight. Short version is employees have a very faint and distant voice. Max, you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, so yeah, I, actually, I think that's that's great, and I, I'll uh, I'll add that uh, in Caesars, they there was an additional committee that was appointed uh, the second the second lien creditors committee. And I believe they were they were the ones that were the most fervent um uh antagonists yeah. of the of the uh um the the debtors council uh and the uh and the ucc kind of tagged along to what the second lien well the ucc actually was did. very militant yeah. at the beginning and then they kind of faded uh, <laughs> yeah. the stock uh, was a uh, was a uh, yeah um, yeah but the ucc did they, they yeah they didn't try to get the uh, uh kirkland fired uh that's uh, true uh, but <laughs> I, yeah no and, and you know, and I did. I did want to get the uh, um, uh, so I, you know either Ted or or uh, the union's uh, perspective on, uh, you know, like how how do uh, uh, like I like at this time we didn't document it exactly, but there was a, an agreement after the great financial crisis happened to renegotiate the like the automatic raises for employees and push that off for a little while. And that wound up working out to the union members advantage later on down the road. Uh, and, and, you know, they, they kept employment for the most part. Uh, we even, we even mentioned that a lot of times the, uh, the members of the, uh, the casino union, uh, they had spouses who uh, lost, had lost their jobs that were in construction uh in in las vegas and so the union wound up being very important for, the, uh, the, for its members during this point in time uh but after uh, like were there any lessons that were learned from uh uh from this uh from caesars uh, uh and uh, you know and how do you approach uh, uh the the private equity sponsor owners of these these casinos right now thanks max i look that's um that really is kind of the thought that goes through my mind when I'm reading your book. Um, as as I'm reading and I'm and it going into the depths of the these cage fights, as Nancy called it, um, between you know all the creditors, lenders, bondholders, and secured and unsecured, and and all along I'm I'm thinking it about where where the workers are um, in this and and. We, we, have, we have a history. I mean, we're a fighting union. That's just what, who we are. And um, we, we've been on, you know, in lots of strikes and, and lots of um, disputes. And we're an organizing union too. Um, and we know how to handle that. We know what to do. Um, and uh, I myself participated in a nine month strike back in 1990. I was a bartender at Binion's Horseshoe. And then of course, after that, we had the frontier strike that was six years, four months, and ten days. And and but when you get into this this arena, it's it's just a um, it's 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 a different ball game. But um, one of the things that that we know is that we are partners with these companies, and if they do well, they have to do well for for us to be able to go in and negotiate uh, good contracts and. You know, we look at the amount of money that gets thrown around. It's in the billions and, and billions of dollars. And, you know, sometimes our members will say, what's going, you know, look, at the, it's just unfair the amount of money that these folks make. And meanwhile, we're scrambling to try to get raises and, and put decent food in the, in the employee dining room for folks and require the company to pay into the health care and, and pensions that people deserve and just staff the place properly. 
And, you know, uh, we have a saying that at the end of the day, rich people are rich. That's just what happens. So we're not about that. It's about trying to figure out how that there's a, a piece of the pie that is there for the workers. So one of the things that we've done, we spent a lot of time looking at what hedge funds of private equity do, and they've got vulnerability, vulnerabilities because they've got to find money to invest. And a lot of that comes from, from massive pension funds. And it's very interesting that the same companies that take these massive pension fund monies to invest them, but they turn a blind eye to worker organizing and worker issues when they invest in you know, big hotels, and casino places. So we are pretty active in that arena in going after their ability to get money. And we learned a lot about that. And we, we try to hold these massive, just, I mean, what is the term masters of the universe? Is that what they're yeah. right? They, they call each other that, I guess, maybe, but, but somebody uh, along coined that term. Um, but at the end of the day, um, they, they, they're, we can go after their, their sources and funding, even the, the largest ones. It seems like an impossible task. So one thing we learned, we've got to go, go follow the money. Um, and we spend time with our members to educate them about what they can do. And the second thing we learned, you know, we knew of what was happening, but we don't have this insight um, of what's happening in the middle of this brawl between all these parties. But one thing we know is that we have leverage if we organize the workforce in the union properties to go after companies, demand transparency and accessibility to you know, what the financial side of things are. And, um, and I think we've really honed the ability to do that. And I guess the last thing I would say is that we're, we're just not gonna be quiet. We're not going to be quiet about entities like this that want to come into our industry and the livelihood of our members. Um, and I think that there really has to be a real hard look um, at the, uh, the characters that um, are heading up this industry that have really taken over gaming, hotel gaming, you know, non-gaming hotels and the industries that we organize in across the country. There has to be a hard look about you know, it's one thing to be able to bring all this money to the table and everybody at the top gets rich, but what happens to the health of the industry and the workers that they have to be able to own homes and put their kids through schools and, and take care of their community? What part of the community do they have responsibility for? And part of having an unlicensed, uh, unlimited gaming license still has responsibility to the industry, the community, and, and to workers. And so David, I'll, I'll jump in here and I'll ask you, uh, someone who's chronicled this uh, this industry for for decades. Just your view on the balance between uh, kind of big money interests. Uh, obviously, we've talked about Apollo buying uh, the Venetian, but Blackstone's become a big investor, particularly in the property side with with MGM. Uh, and just the the balance between the regulators, uh, the Gaming Commission, uh, the Culinary Union, and the workers, uh, and then you know these big money interests who are uh, clearly keen on gaming as a place to, as a place to invest. And, you know, they're doing, uh, ambitious things as far as, you know, uh, amenities and, you know, Las Vegas is as, uh, fancy and, uh, family friendly. And there's just so many things to do now on, on the strip besides just gamble and these, got these incredible resorts. So just your view on how, uh, the balance, uh, the balance is right now between all these interests. Yeah, you know, I think it really does show the evolution of the gaming and hospitality industries in Nevada and in Las Vegas, where it used to be they were mostly, you know, most of the casinos back in the 50s and 60s were run by shareholders where managers were on site and basically, you know, took very good care of their employees. And that was one of their priorities. When it's being run by a fund, there's that distance, you know, and I think that inevitably is going to cause a lot of issues that we've talked about in this call already today. And I think that just shows where we are. And it really does highlight, you know, the need for us to remember, yes, you can make a lot of money in this business, but what business is it? It's the hospitality business, which means people have to feel welcome and well, you need people there for them to feel welcome. So I think it shows how the employees, you know, whatever the next phase of evolution of the finances, I don't think it's really good to lose sight of the goal of the whole business, which is for people to feel good about coming to Vegas. And I think, 
having happy employees is a big part of that. Uh, that I'd like actually to pick up on that. It's a, uh, uh, it's a great point um, uh, that uh, you know, there's a lot of great things that, that have gone on in, in Las Vegas. And there is some distance between when some of these uh, funds wind up owning assets uh, in, um, uh, you know, in, in Las Vegas and Nevada. Uh, and what and what Ted was saying about following the money. Uh, so Sajid and I have have gone on uh, a, you know a tour to you know some of the uh, uh, most famous business schools and law schools uh, in talking about this book. And uh, and I you know I, I really we you know we have to say honestly a lot of the a lot of the students are very bright and well intentioned. Uh, and then the buzz one of the buzzwords in the financial community today is ESG, environmental, social, and, and government uh, investing, uh, which uh, purports to take into account the social and environmental impact of your investments. Uh, now, so I, I'm curious, um, and this could uh, you know this could be uh, uh, for Richard or uh, you know or Ted or Ken, uh, but, but maybe yeah maybe maybe Richard you could answer uh, if you do if you see more. Uh, 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 funds and invest like large investors that you've come to uh, believe are seriously adapting ESG. Uh, and if not, you know, maybe that would uh, be a good thing for some funds to do if they want to uh, I I invest in Las Vegas successfully in the future. The, the, uh, I really like the point David made in, in, a, in a place that David's quite familiar with the Mob Museum, Elaine Wynn and Jan Jones and, and um, I can't remember who the third woman was they were talking and Elaine Wynn said something that I found fascinating she says we miss the boys and, and what she meant is the boys used to take care of the town <laughs> you, you know I taught in Macau and I had a guy that that knew Stanley Ho quite well and Stanley Ho had a checkered reputation but they said that he replaced a failing government and what Stanley Ho did is if there was a drainage problem or if a school needed uniforms or something Stanley fixed it you, you, you know so there has been this, this closeness to the community, which you find, say, in tribal gaming, but you, you seem to be losing, I would suggest, especially with private equity and, and, and these distance funds taking place now. One of the things I've been thinking about is, one, the regulators need to remember they are in charge. You, you, you know, they can really sit on these people and, and, and say, look, these types of behaviors are appropriate and these types of behaviors are not appropriate. I also think, and this is something I've been thinking a lot about lately, is we just really need to rework how we do our boards, you, you know, and it's very much what Max was saying. We, we need uh, we need a committee on boards to talk about sustainability. We need a, a committee, you know, not just compliance and auditing and, and, and compensation. We need to spread out those committees and we need to hold those boards accountable. And one of the best things that happened in this is when they start threatening the five point up to one five point one billion dollar liability for the board members of, of this board. You know, board members need to do more than just show up. They need to take an active role in managing these properties so that they are sustainable. And they're not sustainable if they're if they're hurting the workforces, if if they are damaging the product. You know, we've lost a lot of great entrepreneurs and, and somehow they're supposed to be replaced by these institutions that are essentially invisible and, and seem to be somewhat indifferent about things. Can I piggyback on that for just a second? Because I'm a huge fan of talking about ESG and the pressures on companies. And the advantage of paying attention to the social sides of things and the governance sides of things is on the one hand, You've got companies that are, are pressured to meet their quarterly earnings. That's their sole job. And so they think very short term. When you focus on ESG, you give a countervailing pressure to think much more long term. What are we doing for the people we affect who are not necessarily shareholders, but whose lives change depending on the decisions the board makes? So as there becomes more pressure to pay attention to ESG, I think that is a positive thing for governance generally. And so we have a couple of minutes left here. I think maybe one place uh, we can just uh, we can go uh, in the minutes we have left is just uh, looking forward. Maybe I'll ask each of you uh, just for a prediction on uh, just uh, where Las Vegas kind of goes 
from here, just, uh, you know, there's been a big uh, hospitality and tourism boom recently after a very rough year. Uh, obviously, you know, Apollo is buying Venetian, Blackstone is very active uh, in the MGM properties. And, you know, there's just huge pools of capital that want to put money to work in uh, Las Vegas and hospitality and uh, real estate are all attractive places. So maybe from each of your vantage points, just a, a prediction or something to watch for as a uh, as we enter this next phase of, uh, of gaming, uh, which of course includes sports betting and uh, digital gaming, which has uh, been very popular and there's a lot of you know, money flowing into that. So uh, maybe we can start with, uh, uh, Leanne, you wanna start first? You unmute. Is that for Liane? You're yeah, Liane, yeah. For uh, Suji? Yeah. Oh, was that for me? Yeah, it's for everyone. But yeah, we'll start with you. Well, the one thing I'm going to focus on in the years in the coming is that whoever comes into the town, whoever buys which properties, however that's run, my focus is going to be to make sure that they understand that the people who are working for them, that this is a community. This is where we live. This is where we grow our children. This is where we have our churches here. Whoever comes here have to understand that the people who are working for them, that this is our home. This is where we live. People fly in here and fly out and people buy companies and look at the money and they fly out and they live all over, all over the world. We live here in this valley and we want the best, this, the best for this valley. And that's going to be my focus. Whoever comes here, whatever equity firm, whoever it is, is to make sure that the workers who work here, that they're recognized treat it with respect and earn a wage that's livable and that they'd be able to retire with respect. Thanks for that. I'd like to piggyback on that just for a minute and thank yep. Dane. Um, but I look, clearly the community interests have to be taken into effect. I just think in the right now, I'd say in the near future, I guess I almost have a question for the other folks, Richard and Nancy and David, that, you know, I mean, that examiner's report was a bombshell, right? And it was, and, you know, the book explained it really well, but the truth of the matter is that a lot of the questions that the, uh, of the deal that the examiner's report condemned were approved in across the country, including here in Nevada. So did we miss something here in the, with the Nevada regulation and, and, and how going forward, you know, we've got, um, you know, Apollo buying the Venetian. So, what, what going forward, how does that get dealt with? I don't know if any of y'all want to tackle that in the last few minutes we have here. I, I once gave a speech in Philadelphia and this was after having spent about six weeks of 16 hour days trying to dig myself through Caesar's financials. And I said, I don't believe there's five people in the world that understand Caesar's financials and none of them work for Caesar's. It was a joke, but, 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 but it, you know, we need right now, in my opinion, to really up the game of the regulators. You know, the, the regulators have the ability to shape behaviors in this industry, but they need to do that by understanding the transactions and questioning them. I don't think a lot of people know what went down prior to, and I, this is the strength of this book. I think this has opened a lot of people's eyes. And I think that this transparency is just incredibly valuable to make people understand that, <clears throat> you know, the regulators can look quite bad here, you, you know, if they're not careful. And, um, you, you know, the regulators are also citizens of these communities. And so they're really going to need to specify the behavioral modes that are expected of this industry and enforce it. And, and I think if they do that, that's going to end a lot of the nonsense here. This bankruptcy could have been shortened dramatically, dramatically, in my opinion. I remember, Nancy, I was involved, you may know this, from the stratosphere. And I remember the Bill Bible was upset with me because... I had signed off on $13.4 million of legal fees. Well, that's a good week with these guys, you know. Um, you, you, you know, but but there needs to be a little more adult supervision. And I think the 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 the, the 
you, you know, the regulators just really need to take charge here and say, look, this is how we behave in this industry. And they've done that before and in, in, in at times when they needed to, you know, I mean, they saved this industry on a number of occasions. And I think David would agree with that. Yeah, two more points. I, I, the boards have to pay attention to what they're authorizing and when they're authorizing it. And they can't just be a rubber stamp. They really have to do some independent thought as to whether the deals make fiscal sense, both in the short term and the long term. And my favorite thing to tell law students is just because you legally can do it doesn't mean you always should do it. So you want to think about the ramifications of what you're advising your client to do. That's great. And I would like to, um, so we're going to jump in for, there's a couple of questions that came up. Uh, one, uh, I'll just get to really quickly, uh, uh, was, uh, I, and I, I believe it was about Apollo, uh, you know, getting relicensed. And I think Richard did address that uh, in talking about it, you know, it's, it's going to require some additional scrutiny uh, this time uh, as they, as they return. Uh, next is um, uh, 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 whether or not uh, you know behavior is going to change this time around. I, I, I and I want I, I'd like to kind of piggyback on what people have said in, in, tar in terms of recommendations for how to improve things going forward. One, you know, the regulators. Two, the boards. Uh, and, and I think you know the media plays a part here. And that's where Sujit and I are, are trying to to do our best uh, in in writing these stories in a way. Uh, that isn't, you know, it, it isn't a Manichean story. Uh, it's, it's one that is not, it's not just good versus evil here. Uh, like uh, all the people involved here are human beings. And, uh, you know, people on these boards, it's like, you know, if they've got equity incentives and they see a big enough price, it, you know, they're going to, they're going to approve a deal. Uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, and, uh, you know, if, if there's egos involved and there's a lot of, you know, young executives put in charge of these things uh, competing against their peers, you know, that's, that, that's the type of situation that created a pressure cooker in, you know, in our book uh, as well. And, and you lose sight of, um, uh, you know, other stakeholders that are important. Uh, and, and I do think that the media can play a role in, bringing like the the like the big pers big picture together and showing how you know the actions in one community can affect another uh and especially when it comes to the next generation uh so and, and that's where i i think education will be you know nancy and, and david all the professors uh they're you know they're educating these uh, you know bright young minds it's just you know including a, a a type of um mindset that always takes into account Yes, the profitability of the business, but also what's the, you know, what's the social impact and what's the environmental impact. And really, if you can get a clean triple bottom line, uh, then, you know, you're going to, uh, you're going to create the best businesses for, for all the communities involved. Um, I think that answers that other question. Uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I have, I have nothing else. I, I think that there, I'll, I'll, one coda to this discussion is that, um, uh, Las Vegas is, you know, back in full swing. <laughs> and uh, I report on uh, companies like, you know, like the Venetian and, and also like Cirque du Soleil. Uh, and TPG had owned Cirque du Soleil and lost that company in a, in a restructuring last year. Uh, it's, it's now owned by its creditors and shows are starting up again. Uh, and, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to watch how uh, uh, you know, things play out as, as the businesses, uh, the businesses come back. Uh, uh, Sajid, is there anything else to, uh, uh, to, Max, to add to tie a bow in the conversation? Max, uh, Max uh, this is Ted again. Um, the yeah, president of Unite Here, our parent uh, union has signed on for a quick question before we uh, sign off. Dee, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Um, first, I, I want to thank the authors. Um, but as somebody who's not a financial expert like most of us, um, it seemed to me in the book, what you really pointed out to is an enormous amount of deceitful and frankly fraudulent behavior, which the examiner's report reinforced. And I would go back to what Richard Schwartz said, you know, gaming is a privileged license. And, and you know, Leon Black, by the way, is still, I think, the largest shareholder of Apollo. So he's not away. And his relationship with the two new independent directors is in question. 
all that in taking into account with the authors, I, I would like to ask you and also Richard, how could these people possibly get licensed again based on, frankly, reading your book? And by the way, we sent the book to all the members of the Gaming Control Board and Gaming Commission. Um, and how could that possibly be? Because you, the character, the fraud, the deceit is all out in front of you. And what Richard said earlier about Leon Black is still there. So I'd like to get the author's opinion on that. And Richard, and I, I wanna thank y'all so much. I think you've done a great service to the industry, not just in Nevada, but in this country, because uh, what private equity has done is in my mind, strip mine uh, the assets of good companies and left it fairly bare. And so I, I, I wanna thank you, but I do have that question to both the authors and Richard. Yeah, and so I think one thing that's interesting here is, um, you know, I think the the, the points you made, all, all those are uh, those are conclusions of the examiner's report, which we largely report on, and uh, I think we have reporting around that. But the, the core, uh, those core conclusions, which you alluded to, are uh, uh, from the examiner, who had all the subpoena power and had dozens of investigators. And so, um, the interesting intellectual question, uh, I think, of this book, uh, and people have drawn their own conclusions, uh, as you have, Dee. Uh, is that uh, the, the private equity firms here would say, you know, this company was in big trouble in 2010 and 2011 and 2012. And what we, the private equity firms did was we uh, invested a bunch of capital. We brought in new investors. You know, we bought Planet Hollywood. We created this kind of mobile gaming business. And there's all these things we did to keep this company alive. And uh, because we did that, ultimately, this company uh, did restructure successfully. There was a lot of value at the end, which was one of the ironies of the story. And we talked about Toys R Us earlier. There's other retail companies which just you know, implode. Uh, Caesars is different. And why this is a great story is because at the end of this case, there's a ton of value uh, that comes back. And those firms would argue, you know, we have expertise and we know how to run companies. And uh, the flip side of that are these allegations of fraudulent conveyance and breaches of duty and that, you know, that is, uh, this case was resolved how it was resolved, but, uh, you know, there is a, there is a counterpoint to that and um, that, uh, that, I think there's more tension to it than, uh, than uh, might be, uh, might be obvious. And so, you know, these companies, I think what I would guess is that, you know, firms would argue is that they would, they're going to come to Las Vegas and they're going to invest a lot of money and they are smart entrepreneurs and, uh, the gaming commission and the people who are uh, looking out for other stakeholders have to be uh, have to be critical and have to be smart about these things. If you read the book, uh, we we have the tr we uh, we have the scenes when the original buyout is approved, and the board is trying to ask questions, and you know you have these smart private equity guys, but then you know Gary Loveman says a few things, and he's very charming, and he knows everybody, and he tells everybody tells a couple of jokes, and Frank Shrek is there, and he knows everybody, and he tells a few jokes, and you know they move on to. Uh, the banter part of this. Uh, and so, you know, I think uh, everyone is going to look out for their own interests. And so in that kind of world, uh, the, uh, the regulators have to develop the expertise uh, and um, uh, the critical thinking skills to really assess these firms uh, and these uh, transactions. And, you know, it can, go, it can go both ways. I think you can make the case that people who want to invest in Las Vegas are, uh, are valuable. Uh, and, you know, there has to be proper... Uh, proper scrutiny of, uh, of all sides here. Uh, and I do think that one of the interesting things is in heavily regulated industries like gaming and uh, you know, utilities is another one. There is, the, uh, there is the, the risk of capture, right? There is you know, lobbying that goes on. Uh, and uh, uh, sometimes the more regulation there is and the more kind of uh, oversight there is, the more uh, the more uh, potential there is for mischief. So that's just something to think about. Uh, Richard, I think has kind of alluded to this earlier. Uh, Max, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I, I would add that it, you know, this, there, there's always going to be, a, a, um, or maybe there isn't, but like currently there is a disproportionate amount uh, of reward uh, in you know in financial services uh, uh, you know and and in these investment communities, uh, so the you know you, there a lot of the top talent does wind up in um, 
uh, in, in these positions, a lot of that has shifted towards entrepreneurship too, uh, you know, and, and, and that seems to be pretty good. Uh, uh, but I, I always think it's really important to look, uh, look at incentives in these things. Um, there's a, there's, uh, you know, there's a quote that we kind of, we, we do quote a little tongue in cheek, but I think that is, is true in the book where one of the hedge funds says that, uh, structure determines behavior. Um, and, you know, and that, and that was referring to the structure of these hedge funds where, you know, some are mark to market and they have to mark their books every every quarter. And so they're pressured to get returns without long-term thinking and others have long-term capital and they're able to take their time with it. But I think that also applies to, uh, you know, just the, 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 the investment uh, community in, uh, as a whole, private equity investment, hedge fund investment as a whole. Uh, and, you know, there should be a lot of thinking about the structure. I know that there's, there's always been talk about the capital gains tax and, uh, you know, how effective lobbying can be. Uh, we go into kind of how, uh, how lobbying, you know, gets done or, or law change does get done during political gridlock. And uh, that seems to be not, not the best way in terms of you just try to insert uh, some sort of rider into must pass legislation in order to get, you know, may, maybe a little arcane laws change that could help your, your personal case or your business. Uh, so I, I, I feel like there's a lot of structural uh, things to continue to look at and investigate uh, so that, that they're improved to, um, to, you know, to find better outcomes, uh, uh, you know, for, for, for the people involved. Dee, you wanted to, my comments? Yes, please. I, I, I mentioned earlier that I think that the Nevada Gaming Control Board and the entire state of Nevada wants to get to yes on this thing on the going forward basis. I just believe that. This is a huge transaction. And Apollo, I think, could help them out enormously if Apollo were to come to them and suggest that they may have made mistakes in the past and have a process by which those mistakes can be eradicated in the future and controls as to where there were breakdowns can be put in place. Um, I, I think that would be great if they're going to just say that that these guys didn't know what they were writing in that book. The examiner was, was a fool and, and, and stuff like that. I, I think that would be terribly unfortunate for Las Vegas. And I think it would be terribly unfortunate. You, you, you know, I mean, we've had the opportunity to learn here and these two brilliant authors and, and, and what I will call their third author. And I've heard them use this term as well. You, you know, Richard Davis have allowed us to learn things. And I think it's valuable in this type of forum that we are able to get this word out. Now, what do we do with that learning? If we don't do anything with that learning, it's gonna happen again. You know, so, so I think we need to demonstrate that we've learned from this experience. And I think the regulators need to do that. And I think it would be brilliant if Apollo would do that. No, I don't know if it's in their DNA. I just don't, you, you, you know, to, to admit a mistake and, and, and to suggest that they can do things better and build controls and to ensure that, but, but that's what I would like to see. Thank you. Great, uh, well, I think uh, that may be a good, uh, a good place to, to stop this uh, discussion, um, but uh, this was great. It was great to have all these diverse voices uh, and all interesting viewpoints. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the coming weeks and months. Uh, obviously appreciate uh, everyone's interest uh, in our book. Uh, and I hope, uh, yeah, maybe sometime we can do this uh, in person now that uh, uh, Las Vegas is uh, opening up again. So Sujit and Max, we just want to thank you so much for uh, uh, agreeing to come and moderate this panel and also to um, just the work that you've done in exposing really the, the inside of, of that piece of the industry. And, and again, uh, I think we want to continue this discussion. And I think it could continue uh, today for a long time, but I mean, in the future, and we'll hopefully uh, have you uh, in Vegas in person, hopefully, and, um, and additional uh, uh, forums and panels, because I think this is critical to the, to the industry. And, and we think as a culinary union that this is a discussion needs to be had. So I just want to say for everyone, thank you so much. David, appreciate it, Leanne, Richard, and obviously the questions. And, and, um, and if 
folks should take a look at this book. It'll be, it'll be quite a read. So uh, I think we're, we're at a wrap. Thank you very much.